Hello, this is Dr. Jeffrey Lieberman of Columbia University's Department of Psychiatry speaking to you today for Medscape. This past weekend, in a little over 24 hours, gun violence claimed the lives of 30 people and injured a dozen more. It's possible the death toll will be even higher since some of the casualties who were wounded are still recovering. Almost as tragic as the incidents themselves is the fact that mass shootings have become a routine part of life in America. It no longer feels unusual to turn on the news and see the mugshot of another angry young man who has committed another act of violence targeting multiple innocent victims, leaving behind nothing but an angry manifesto, a trail of dead and wounded bodies, and a host of unanswered questions. In the aftermath of these incidents, an all too familiar scenario unfolds. The media and the public erupts in outrage and emits cries of never again. But after the chest thumping dies down, the soul searching begins. And then the requisite question of why, why could this happen? How could this happen? Now, politicians and pundits solemnly weigh in with their sanctimonious platitudes and eventually the argument devolves into the familiar refrain of name calling and partisan bickering, which leads to no consensus being reached and nothing being done to prevent these things from happening in the future. In this political theater, mental illness too often becomes the convenient scapegoat. It is used to deflect attention from other causes, such as the NRA, the ineffective gun control laws, a culture of hate, the lack of respect for morals and laws. However, the data expose the mendacity of this claim. In 2019 alone, there have been 255 reported mass shootings in the United States. These happen in places that we visit routinely in our communities every day, from schools to religious institutions to shopping malls and movies. The perpetrators of these crimes are uniformly male and can be categorized by their respective motivations, such as being ideological zealots, domestic or foreign terrorists, disgruntled employees or disaffected loners, and untreated persons with mental illness. But a recent white paper by an expert group of uh, people from disciplines such as mental health care, law enforcement, uh, education, that was commissioned by the National Council on Behavioral Health, found that approximately a quarter, 25% of these crimes were perpetrated by individuals with mental illness and impelled by their symptoms, which were not adequately treated. Now, these individuals who suffer from mental illness had only a small number of different diagnostic conditions, psychotic disorders, mood disorders, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Thus, 75% of these crimes were caused by people for other reasons than mental illness. It's not fair and it's not accurate to say that anybody who commits mass violence is prima facie mentally ill because that's not, just not the case. Moreover, the main diagnoses of the people who were mentally ill causing these crimes from those four diagnostic categories have comparable frequencies of men and women being affected. Yet, almost 100% of the culprits of mass violence are male. So this clearly implicates other factors in prompting these people to commit these heinous crimes, such as ready access to weapons, a permissive culture with relaxed restrictions that encourages individual expression, the internet, ubiquitous exposure to violence in the entertainment media, and the increasingly prevalent availability of recreational intoxicants. Another analysis that was reported in the New York Times on November 7, 2017, entitled, What Explains U.S. Mass Shootings? International Comparisons Suggest an Answer. Well, this article disentangled the variables of mental illness, treatment of mental illness, and violence. And it found that the rates of untreated mentally ill persons who commit criminal violence was comparable in other countries as in the U.S., However, the reason why the frequency of such crimes and the number of victims 
was so much greater in the U.S. was found to be that there's more people who suffer from mental illness that go untreated in the U.S. and because of the greater availability of guns. So instead of an untreated mentally ill person subject to their symptoms having access to firearms, in other countries they may use a knife or a hammer or some other weapon, which is still terrible, but it doesn't inflict as much lethality. Now I find it ironic that psychiatrists should have to caution people not to falsely pathologize objectionable behavior when we are so often accused of broadening the DSM diagnostic boundaries by doing the same. It's also reminiscent of the slippery slopes that the use of diagnoses of mental illness to brand politically dissident behaviors as mental illness leads us down, as well as psychiatrists, as is being the case with our current president, using labels of mental illness to discredit political figures without having adequate data or permission to do so. In this country, we pay a price for our cultural openness and individual freedoms of belief and expression. That enables us to be the world's engine of, crea of creativity and innovation. However, there is a dark side to this and a price that we pay for unless we do something to stop this, this will be a mixed blessing. The good news is that this problem is actually tractable. It can be solved. The bad news is that it requires a policy and legislation driven solution. And therein lies the rub because the obstacle in this case is the partisan political stalemate that exists in our federal government. If we're to seriously address mass violence in our country, then we need to stop using mental health as bad faith arguments to prevent us from finding real solutions to this problem. There are over 50 million people in the United States with a mental illness. They deserve compassion and care, not vilification and being turned into scapegoats to serve a political agenda of expedience. Thank you for listening. This is Dr. Jeffrey Lieberman of Columbia University's Department of Psychiatry speaking to you today for Medscape.